Hey, thank you guys for joining this session. Uh, a technical session at 4 p.m. in the afternoon. I hope you guys are ready for that. Uh, how was the day today? How was the talks and you guys awesome? Amazing. All right, so let me try to close it with like a good note, I guess. Um, today we're gonna do a workshop on how to build an eBPF uh, a CNI plugin that uses eBPF. Uh, it, it's going to be a tutorial for about an hour and a half. I'm going to try to make it actually shorter just for you guys to, to rest a bit from this long day. All right. You guys ready? Amazing. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. A bit about myself. My name is Adam Saya. I work at Solo. Um, in the past couple of years, I've been very focused on what we call application networking in general. So I deal with API gateways and service mesh every day. And kind of the focus there is to secure the traffic and secure the network in general. Now, thing I'm, one thing I'm very much uh, interested in these days is how can I do more instead of operating at L7 on the layer seven, where it's kind of the application uh, layer, I want to see how many policies and how much we can get from doing controlling the traffic way earlier on the network stack. And that's basically where the CNI and ABPF operates, right? It's very much networking at a very low level. So today, um, again, we are going to do a CNI ABPF workshop. But we are not going to recreate Solium, right? We are not going to do something, anything complicated. I think the goal of this session is mainly, um, you know, to solve this curiosity that everyone has, right? For example, for me, when I was a kid, I always been asking my dad, like, hey, how things work? And he gave me, like, the, the quick pitch, right? For example, for us today, is like opening a car and, you know, opening the hood and saying, hey, this is the engine and this is the battery. And you know that's pretty much it. As long as if we can understand the kind of the underlying mechanism being used in these technologies like Solium and other uh, a big project that use eBPF, then it's a good it's a good day. All right, all right. So let's get started. What we are going to do today? A couple things. We are going to start with a small presentation around what's a CNI. Okay, a very few slides going on talking about the basics. We are not going to deep dive too much into it, but at least just to get the main idea of how things work. After that, we are going to uh, use our laptops. I don't know if you guys are ready for that. You guys can follow with me too, uh, to create our own first CNI. After that, we're going to talk about eBPF and kind of the use cases we can use it with, uh, with the CNI. We are going to talk about a bit of more complexity there when we talk about monitoring. And we're going to end with uh, how we can use eBPF for security uh, in, our, in our CNI. And at the end, we're just going to have a small conclusion and any questions. All right? You guys ready again? Awesome, awesome. All right, so a, a quick question because I've, I was very much, uh, when designing this workshop, I was, you know, trying to figure out the right technology to use, especially for the code. So just by a raise of hand here, who writes Golang? All right, good thing because we're gonna do this in Bash, All right? <laughs> right, I, look, we, I was looking for the kind of the simplest way to do it, and I think Bash helps a lot. Bash has a lot of abstractions, and we can just like use, um, you know, CLIs that are pretty much simplifying our life. Golang is definitely the language of choice when you try to deal with this situation. Selenium uses it, there's, there's good documentation out there, but obviously it brings its own complexity around error handling and all these things. Today we don't need that, today we just need to understand the mechanisms, okay? All right, let's get going here. What is a CNI? A CNI is basically, if you think about any Kubernetes cluster, Docker, other projects use CNI is a way to 
provide the wiring, provide the wiring for any container, right? In our case here, we're talking about Kubernetes, a pod, right? How can I allow a certain pod to have a certain IP, be connected, be able to reach it, be able to interact with it? That's the core thing around what a CNI is, a CNI plugin in this, in this example. Now, you can think about a CNI plugin as the, you know, a plumber, basically, wire, like creating the, the, the pipes between kind of the network host, uh, the host network and, and, and your containers and, and pods, okay? So that's definitely the easiest way to, to describe what a CNI is. And now we're gonna talk about basically the, the spec a bit, okay? The, the spec of the CNI project is, is stable now. It's, it's been 1.0.0 for a while. It has a very well-documented way of operating. It's, it's straightforward, and I, I definitely invite you guys to read this documentation. And in this couple slides, we're just gonna go through the basics. But again, there's a couple nuances that I would like you guys to go and review after all. So what does the CNI project provide us? It provides us three main things. First is the specification of what the CNI is and how it should operate. It provides us some example implementation that you can just use and reuse. And at the end, it also provides us some libraries to kind of simplify our life. We don't have to re reinvent the wheel every single time, okay? And obviously today, we are reinventing the wheel just for an educational purpose. All right, so if we zoom in a bit of how actually things operate, it, there is a couple steps, okay? So there's always this, what we call a container runtime. It can, you know, there's, uh, when you diff use different technology, it means different things. And if you talk about Kubernetes, that's probably Kubelet. That needs to create, you know, it needs to create a pod, needs, it needs to wire it. So the way it works is you have this container runtime that needs to interact with something to wire this pods that got created. In this case, we are using a CNI plugin for this. The container runtime is going to do first, is gonna uh, go and read a certain configuration. We're gonna go into this detail in a bit, right? Right now we don't have to very much uh, focus on this, but now that the CNI runtime, the, the container runtime, sorry, in this case, Kublet, Kublet for, for communities, will go and look for a network configuration, okay? It's a file, it's just a JSON file that describes certain things that we need to pass to SNI. And then it's gonna actually call a binary, just a bin, passing certain environment variables and that network configuration, and expects a couple things from the CNI plugin. So the CNI plugin gonna receive this configuration it's gonna be invoked with certain environment, environment variables. The CNI plugin, based on this information, gonna do what the CNI plugin is doing, you know, creating the interface, wiring everything, and then returns a result that goes back to the container runtime to say, well, this was a success. My container now is wired, okay? In a nutshell, that's what it is. It's basically a configuration file, a binary, and something that calls the binary with configuration file. All right, so let's take a look at the configuration file. And this is a very simple one. Every CNI configuration file has a couple, couple fields. Certain are mandatory and certain are optional. Definitely the thing that is very important here is the CNI version. Again, I said there is multiple specifications. Kind of the last one is 1.0.0, that's the one we're using today. But there's also other ones like, you know, 300, 400, uh, like zero, sorry, 040 and 030 and, you know, old versions. Then there is the type. The type is, in our case, if you want to simplify it, is the binary name that we are going to invoke, right? In this case, it's called bridge. Um, then we have certain keys that are called like, well-known keys, right? Well-known keys, like in my example here, IPAM and, and DNS, these well-known keys are, can be used by CNI to invoke another CNI plugin, right? That's what you call like delegation, for example. I don't wanna go too much in, 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 uh, in detail about this subject. We're not gonna use it today. But for example, 
if you are invoking a CNI plugin that needs to basically assign a certain IP, sometimes you want to use another CNI plugin that is much actually very focused on actually IP generation, right? It can be host local, it can be DHCP, it can be other, other processes. But again, that's just a small parenthesis here. And again, there is also this uh, field that are called capabilities. And these capabilities are dynamic fields that are being invoked when, when the container runtime invokes the CNI, it dynamically changes this field with certain values. Again, this is probably much too much detail right now. We're not going to use that today, but just to know that exists there. And I, th I think the last one, which is important in our example, is that you can pass custom keys, custom key value keys. So it's going to be any detail you want to pass to your CNI plugin. We're going to use this today in our workshop. All right. So now let's talk about, I, I talked about, you know, the configuration file. I, I said it's a binary. We need to invoke the, invoke the binary with the configuration file. But I also mentioned that when we have a successful call to the CNI plugin, it returns a certain result that the container runtime reads and be able to process and obviously update itself. Uh, the container runtime probably just, you know, print that at, in STD out. It's kind of a format here in JSON that define the IPs, define the routes. Also, that's all part of the CNI uh, spec. And we don't have to really much dig into it here today right now, but just know that there is a result, and the result is, in our example here for the bridge, is to return the IP that's been assigned to a certain container or a certain pod if we're talking about Kubernetes. All right. One last quick step here. Let's talk about execution, okay? Execution of the CNI plugin is uh, pretty, again, pretty straightforward. We have the container runtime. They're going to go and read a certain configuration that is uh, by default put under slash etc CNI net D and the name of the configuration. It's going to read that configuration and then invoke the CNI, uh, you know, binary based on that configuration that is under, by default, it's under uh, slash opt CNI bin and the binary itself. So in this case, uh, and it passes, again, it executes and pass certain environment, en environment variables. Okay? And the environment variables, we're going to see that in a second here. Kind of uh, just a quick intro to things we're going to use later. Every invocation of the CNI plugin has, again, it's invoking the binary and passing environment variables. This environment variables can, are the CNI command. Basically, are we trying to add the container? Are we trying to delete the container? Are we just checking if the container is good? Then we're passing a container, the CNI a container ID. So basically, uh, in Kubernetes, that's the container ID itself. It's just a reference to the pod that needs to be set. We are passing a CNI NetNS, and we're going to get to this later. That's basically to, you know, a way for, the, for, for us to control where this uh, network namespace, and I'm going to talk about network namespace in a second, where the network namespace is going to be created. A CNI F name is the interface, like, you know, the network interface that the container runtime is expecting from the CNI to create on a specific container or pod in this case. And uh, the CNI args are all the values that we put in our configuration earlier that can be passed down to our uh, CNI. And CNI path is optional here, but again, if basically the CNI is not on the default path, then you have to look for where is the, you know, the binaries. All right, one last thing here. CNIs can, you can use multiple CNIs, right? You can use multiple CNIs, you don't have to use only one. So sometimes you have different use cases. You, have, you probably have an interface CNI, basically the one that creates the wiring, that creates the inter interface itself. But sometimes you have another CNI that just do some sort of tuning or whatever it is, right? And sometimes you want to split this logic into multiple plugins. In our case here, uh, CNI1, you know, let's say CNI2 is invoked and you get the previous result from the execution of CNI1 passed to, to the plugin 2 and to plugin 3. And again, if you have 10, it's going to operate the same. 
you know, that's kind of a way to say, don't think that the CNI is just a replacement. You, you have to like completely replace the CNI you have running. Sometimes you, it, it complement, they complement it, it uh, themselves. All right, time to start our first CNI plugin. You guys, you guys all have like access to a laptop. And again, you guys can follow with me here, but if you have a laptop and you wanna do this lab, like run it on your own environments, uh, that, that'd be great. All right. The exercise today, what we are going to do is we are going to create a bridge plugin. This is a very simple example. And again, there is multiple ways of creating a CNI. There is, a, you know, in terms of like defining an interface. There's like point to point, that like Valen, there's multiple ones. But the simplest one, I think, to understand the basic of CNI is the bridge plugin. So here's what we're gonna do in this session. Actually, before I get there, if anyone wants to run this workshop on their laptop, right, go on this link. Okay, I'm gonna pause there for a second for everyone to, to copy it. It, it, it pretty simple, it's just bit.ly slash ebpf cni, okay? That will take you to our lab environment that we are gonna use for the exercise. Are you guys good? Just let me know if you guys all, okay, all right. Awesome, okay, cool. I'm gonna go back to, let me actually start my environment too, so because it takes about two minutes to be ready. Click on that just in the meantime. And if you click on start, you should get on this uh, page here where it tells you that the challenge is, is loading. And yeah, let's talk about what we are going to do today. Let's create a bridge CNI plugin. What we are going to do is define the CNI plugin that first creates a bridge if it's not existing. We're gonna call it bridge zero. We're gonna assign an IP to the bridge, right? The bridge is connecting, is, is connected with the, uh, you know, host network. So that's how we get the connectivity to the host. And then the bridge, we're gonna define what we call V8 pairs. One, V8 pair is like, you can think like a cord. You know, so basically you're gonna put one end plugged to the bridge and the other end plugged to the container. Very simple. Again, I have a bridge connected to the host network. I have a V8 pair, one attached to the bridge, one attached to the container. Again, that's what we're gonna do. So let's go back to this one. Probably take about uh, a minute here. Yeah, so in the meantime, since I have a minute here to, to talk about things, uh, again, we are gonna do everything here today in Bash for simplicity and we're taking a lot of abstractions. But the good thing is we are going, like if you want to do this for real, like and just use like the right technologies, there is multiple projects. For example, there is uh, the Selenium eBPF uh, project that has good examples of like how you, how you can define Actually, you know, the EPF integration later on, there is the uh, container network, you know, networking uh, repo, and it has a lot of good examples. If you go uh, here on the plugins that are provided, actually the bridge one we're gonna do right now in Bash already exists in Golang, and you can just go and copy it right away. Okay, let's go back here to instruct. It's taking about 20 seconds. If anyone has a good joke, no? Okay. So instruct is pretty easy here. You don't have, you don't have to install anything. Uh, what we're gonna need is basically this tab here. It's gonna have a panel on the left where we're gonna have all the instructions and then we're gonna have a terminal on the sorry, a terminal on the right, 
and we have all the instruction. No, wait a second. The terminal is in the left, sorry, and the instructions are on the right, and it's probably just a copy paste exercise at this point. So, quick question here Who has this, uh, the environments ready? Wow. So, you guys faster than me here. Okay, well, wait for me, right? Um, okay. Keep going. Time soon. Do you guys see the uh, the the terminal? Okay. Interesting. I'm gonna give it another try on a different tab. Ah, there you go. Okay, just being patient. Okay, there you go. Let's go. Let's start. So, what we are going today to do today is, is pretty straightforward. We are going to first um, create a Kubernetes cluster, a single node Kubernetes cluster that doesn't have anything much. It doesn't have any CNI. Okay, for that we're gonna use Kube EDM. It's it's uh, it's a very simple uh, Kubernetes cluster here. Again, basics. So to use this platform, it's straightforward. Go and click on the command, right? Click on whatever you want to copy, and then go to the terminal and paste. All right. First step is creating a Kubernetes cluster without any CNI installed. It's taking a couple seconds to get it ready. And once done, now we have a Kubernetes cluster. I can run the second command here. It's just to basically wire uh, you know, the kube config. So now I can run commands like kubectl get pod. If I run the kubectl get pod command, You guys can see from back there? Good? All right. So if I run the kubectl um, command, oops, I, I see here that I have a couple pods that are running, but I have two that are pending. Right? So the core ones, the core Kubernetes pods are, are started, that's fine. But anything that, is need, that needs a CNI to operate, it's in pending. Right? That's because we don't have any CNI installed at this point. So even if you start any like hell world or you know HTTP bin or whatever service, it will not work at this point. So let's let's fix that. Let's actually create our first CNI plugin. The first step we're gonna do here is to copy the skeleton of our CNI plugin. Let's copy it. And let's open it on this tab. So cop copy the command, like run the command, copy. And then let's go to the editor here. Press, re press refresh if you don't see it right away. You know, sometimes it, it takes a couple, uh, a couple times to, to pop up. Now that you cl click on the file and let's just read the first, you know, what's, this is the kind of the basics of our CNI plugin. It's just a bash file and it has a couple commands that we need to, to do. So we are reading this environment variable, CNI command. Rem remember, right? The, the, the container runtime execute the binary and pass certain environment variable. As part of this environment variable, we have the CNI command. What we want to do? In this case, there's multiple operations. Actually, I, I'm, I'm missing one here that doesn't really matter. But in our case, we want to focus on adding a pod and deleting a pod, right? So in this case, we have case add, delete, check, and version. All right, this is very basic. Let's keep going here. And now let's implement the add function in our CNI plugin. So the add function is going to do a couple things. The add function is going to grab, you know, first we're gonna get the CRDR 
of the of the of the node like what kind of what kind of IPs are allowed on a certain node then we are going to create a, a, again a bridge like we said and then we're going to create the v8 pair one plugged to the bridge one plugged to the container and then we're going to return a certain result saying well everything's done everything's good so let's run this command here uh, we're going to copy the, the step to add, going back to the terminal, run this. And now if you go to the editor, just again, refresh the page if you don't see the, the, new, the new code. And let's go line by line here, trying to understand what we did. Again, this is bash. It's very much simplified for a lot of things. Write it in Go if you want to do it, right? Um, the first thing is to... We are going to pass, right? We are going to pass the pod CIDR using the, remember, the configuration, the JSON configuration. We are going to pass in that JSON configuration the pod CIDR of the node. So every single node has a pod CIDR. We're going to pass that to the CNI plugin. Then we are going to create a bridge. We are using, again, just CLI commands to do a lot of things. In this case, we are creating a bridge called bridge uh, zero. Sorry, I'm just going to remove this so it's easy to read. Um, OK, there you go. Yes, yeah, so the first step, again, is creating the bridge if it doesn't exist. In this case, it's called bridge zero. Then we are assigning uh, like a gateway IP, an IP itself to the bridge, right? So the step here is, is to assign the IP. And then we are going, we, are, we need to figure out the IP of a container, right? Again, this is very, very bad code. You don't do that in general, right? Do not go and do a random to figure out what kind of IP, you know, we have. But, you know, you probably use the HCP instead and so on. In this case, we are running this command to figure out, let's grab an IP. Let's grab an IP without, within the CIDR, CIDR range that we passed in the configuration. So we are doing a random between 2 and 255, okay? Basically an IP there. We're going to grab this IP, put it in a variable called IP. Again, remember, the steps are pretty easy. First, create the bridge, define an IP for the container, create the V8 pair, plug one in the bridge, plug one in the container. All right. So we did... We did the two first ones. We created the bridge, and we generated an IP randomly. The step after that is to basically create the V8 pair. To create the V8 pair, we are using uh, IP link add, where with one, the one side of the, the V8 pair is the CN, CNI if name that's been passed through the execution of the CNI plugin. Again, that's configuration coming from the container runtime. And the other, the other end is basically the name of the interface that we are going to create for this specific pod. That's the one, this, in, this new interface is the one that's going to be plugged to the bridge. So here's the V8 pair. Now we have our extension cord, right? But it's not plugged yet. We just have that. What we are going to do is to plug one end in the bridge. There you go. IP link set, uh, the, the, the end of one of the V8 pairs is now plugged in, in the bridge zero. Now we have the other end of our extension cord that we need to plug in the container itself. So what we are going to do is to define the, contain, the, the network namespace. To do this, we're going to do a couple, a couple commands here. But long story short, we are defining our uh, network namespace that we called in, in, you know, we're just using a link here to container uh, CNI. It's going to be slash var run net ns slash container uh, CNI container ID. That's basically our uh, network uh, namespace being defined. Then what we are going to do is to basically go and put that other end of the extension cord within this network namespace that we just defined, okay? We're going to plug it there. 
The second thing, we're going to define the IP, right? Important. We haven't used the IP yet, right? Now we're using the IP, the one we generated randomly. We are defining that, putting that in the, in our network namespace. So we did the two things. We, we, again, we plug the other end to the container. We define the IP. The last thing is to define the default gateway that basically just to carry all the traffic that goes within the network namespace out and that through the default uh, gateway that we just define, we define in the bridge, right? That's kind of the way to say, this is how you route traffic. So once we did these steps, right, we did, again, I'm probably repeating myself, but just to understand the concept, we created the bridge, if not existing, we define an IP, we created the V8 pair, and we plugged the both ends. Now that, you know, you mean like, we mean it's, it's, it's good. We, we are done now. We define connectivity to our container. Let's report this success to our container runtime. The container runtime now will get a result to say, oh, you know what? That's good. That's good for me. And we are using, obviously, the, net, the CNI specification format to return certain results. What we are going to use here is we're going to return the uh, certain information, for example, the IP of this, of this specific, we're going to return this IP of this specific uh, container that we generated. We're going to return the MAC address uh, and, and, and so on, okay? And which gateway is being used and so on. And it's, again, the CNI spec is very much very flexible, and the way it operates is it's captured data, you know, we don't even have to return it in a certain way. You just print it in STD out. That's all we need to do. So we're doing a print right now. That's the result that the container, I, the container runtime will capture and say, hey, well, now that's a success. You see? Very basic. Again, this is a very basic container. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Good question. So the question is how we got the pod CRDR and why it's not part of, uh, you know, uh, part, part of the environment variable. The, the, the pod CRDR, this is not part of the spec, right? This is, this is basically the spec defines the way to, to wire a certain pod. It, it doesn't do it in the context of Kubernetes. The pod CRDR in this case is very much tied to the, to the pod CRDR of a node. And that's why we have to pass it through the configuration and not through an environment variable. That's basically the result. Okay? Awesome. So, uh, good. The last thing we have to do here is to define the del, the delete command. And again, it's going to see it's very hard. Very complicated code to add the deletes. So copy the delete code, refresh. There you go. Very complicated code. OK. That's all we have to do to delete uh, a network namespace in this, in this case, you know, removing the pod. It's just going to go and remove the certain network namespace on that path. Very simple. We don't have to define the check. The version we're just going to return, basically, which kind of CNI version we're using in this case, which kind of spec. And this, in this case, we're using 1.0.0, but this code is compatible with multiple versions. All the, you know, we are no, we're not doing anything complicated, so basically, we have very much compatibility with everything. Amazing. You guys ready to see that in action? I don't want to see some excitement. All right. Okay, so before we get, we get there, uh, let's actually talk about the good point that our friend asked here is basically how to, how to pass this, this uh, pod CIDR uh, information. In this case, I'm, I'm putting that directly here, 10, 10, 0, 0, slash 24. Why? Just because I also control the pod CIDR during the installation itself of Kubernetes, right? We cannot, I, I, I passed the same version, so I, I kind of guessed what kind of version I need in my CNI. This is not common. This is not, in real world, that doesn't work like this. In, in the real world, you will need to create a certain process that goes and read, you know, calls the cube API, get the, get the pod, you're gonna need to do this. Look, if, if I take a look at my node, 
it's very small, actually. I think I should zoom in. So if I do, um, maybe I zoom in more. So if I do k get node, so k for kubectl get node, uh, and take a look at what I have, I have only one node. Again, it's a single node, Kubernetes cluster in this case. And if I take a look and do a dash o yaml, then I'll see, like if I scroll up, um, there you go. You see, the pods CIDR, that's the one I actually just put statically in my configuration file that I'm going to use as an example. But this process is not like that. You know, if you want to use a real use case, you want to create a mechanism that goes and read this community's API, get this, uh, get this address, put it in the template of the, conf of the configuration file that's going to be set on the host. So going back to our example, so we have the binary now. We're good there. We're going to create the configuration file. It's very basic. You see the configuration file for us, the network configuration, very, very basic. We are just putting the CNI version. We are going to, going to put the type, which is, again, it's the binary name in our case. And we are putting the, the pod CIDR that I just showed you right now through Kubernetes. Right? That's it. All right. Let's, let's, let's try it. If we run this, so in this case, I just created two more pods, okay, just to demonstrate that this thing is broken still very much. So right now, I have two pods uh, in pending my HTTP bin service, uh, service or, or pod here is in pending, the sleep one, two, and this core DNS ones. But basically, yeah, I don't have a CNI yet. Let's fix this. What you have to do is just to copy, again, I, I talked about kind of the default where you need to put the configuration. We're going to put our binary, our bash script we just created, under slash opt CNI bin. And I'm going to put the configuration that we just wrote right now, again, under the default, slash etc CNI net D. Let's do this. Wait for it. And then give it a couple seconds. And a couple seconds. More. OK. How long am I going to have to wait here? Ooh. Check the, check your well, I, I should probably do that. I don't think it's aired. It's kind of control all, you know, control all the code here. What would I err? <laughs> uh, did I, wait a second. So what do we have here? We did the modification of the pod. Let me take a look. And the cop. Oh, there you go. What's going on here? Um, do, do I have like? Um, Let's, let's just force the deletion just to kind of force cube. Where's that? Get what is that, sir? After the copy? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I did the copy. I don't know. Let's see. I'm just going to force the recreation of the pods. Pending still. What's going on? Let's see. Sorry. Let me double check. OK. Describe. Um, yeah. Uh, mm, presumption. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Why this is not? I, I did, I put the, yeah. This was intaded anyway. That's crazy.
no, I, I needed to, to remove the taint for me to schedule the pods on the same on the master node. Um, but the, the taints are not there anymore because it's scheduled, actually it's scheduled the two pods. Uh, what's going on here? What's going on? Let's see, let's see, let's see. Did I miss something else? Um, oops. What is that? The node is not ready? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the node is not ready because the CNI is not there. Once the CNI is installed, it's going to put it back to ready. Uh, okay, what's, what's happening here? Yeah, I did. Okay, look, let's do this. So not block on this. I'm going to get to that in a second. I'm going to go back to do the command quickly, just creating a new environment quick, you know. Do not be blocked on, like, try to debug this live because it's not going to happen. Uh, but question, do you guys have the pods container running? Okay, that's what matters. I did that already, multiple times. <laughs> so what we are going to do, I think the way I'm going to do it to kind of simplify this, now that pods are running and all this, that's awesome. So what I'm going to do this quickly is to create... Uh, Going back to my exercise, I'm just going to, oops, I'm going to start that on here, and I'm going to catch up. Don't worry. We'll figure this out. I'll have to dime the, should not debug live. Never works. All right. Let's go back to this. Okay. Awesome. So, again, let me know how many ones have the thing running. All right, that makes me happy. That's all that matters. Um, so what we are going to do next is to talk about the next step from there. Okay, so now we have the the CNI being installed. The node is, the node is is ready to ready to take uh, traffic. We have the you know we have the pods networking figured out. That's great. The step from there is, okay, let's talk about EPPF now. Let's talk about how we can improve certain things using EPPF. So in our example, we did something very basic. We just created the interface. But what if I want to control this interface to, for example, monitor all the traffic going through, or I want to secure the traffic that goes through that interface, right? For this, we are going to use eBPF. By raise of hand here, who, who knows about eBPF in general? OK, great, great. So who wrote any eBPF code before? What's that? Yes, it's by, by definition it is. Okay, so we have a couple ones. Awesome. All right, so again, this is going to be very, very, very basic code, eBPF code. So don't be scared. We have to write some code, but it's going to be very, very straightforward. So eBPF, what it is? You can think about eBPF. I'm probably going to skip this because uh, I think it matters more to talk about this. eBPF is... You can think about it as like a VM within the kernel where you can run some code that is very much, you know, in a sandbox that can do things for you. Like it can attach to certain hooks. So there's hooks for everything. There's hooks for networking. There's hooks for like file access. Linux defined a lot of hooks for different things. And eBPF in our case, and here we're going to talk about networking mostly, we can attach a certain code watching for a certain hook and do something. That's kind of the, the three part of, of what we can do in eBPF. Now, the do, th do something can be monitor the traffic. It can be secure the traffic. It can be detect anomalies. It can be a lot of, of things like this. So here is uh, an example of kind of, you know, if you look at the, at the stack, there is multiple hooks. Oops, I'm going to put it on slideshow to go there. If you look at, there's multiple hooks, you know, uh, you can, there's hooks under the lowest level is XDP, okay? From there, there's hooks that goes to traffic control, and there's all the way up some, some BPF co code that can watch for syscalls. 
Who knows here what's XDP or heard of before? Okay, a couple ones. All right. XDP, you can think about it as way, like, it's called Express da Data Path. It's an EPPF, you know, it's an EPPF that allows you to basically, like, connect to the lowest level, level of your networking. Okay, very, very low level. The, the thing, because it's low level, it is, doesn't have much access to a lot of the data of the traffic, but it's very fast. This is kind of the, 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 down, the pros and cons. The XDP allows us to do traffic shifting fast. Rewriting a full packet, like for example, I wanna load balance for, from, from different points. Uh, I wanna detect anomalies super fast. Uh, I wanna restrict traffic very fast. You know, I wanna, I wanna build like, let's say, um, firewalls and so on. XDP is very good for that. TC is a little bit up the stack. It's actually have more data around the packets. So you can do, like, you know, packet mingling. We can change ports. We can, you know, change the queue. We can, there's different things that we can do at the, at the TC level. If you look at Cilium, actually, Cilium uses both. Cilium would use certain parts of the, of the system in, you know, using TC for control of like probably, especially routing on, on egress because TC can be routed, routing on, on, on egress where, where XDP can come only be on ingress. XDP allow you to kind of do, you know, load balancing again at low level. In comparison, if you use Cilium using XDP, here, here's a, 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 you know, an interesting diagram I got from the Cilium documentation where it shows you that if you use Cilium with XDP, the amount of free data, like free CPU, is huge compared to like the basic Q proxy. That is basically saying that using XDP is way faster and more efficient in terms of like processing of the traffic. So let's go back to my uh, environment fast and see if I can catch up with you guys. So and I'm gonna go here. I'm gonna create my, uh, all right. Hopefully this time works. I'm gonna create my environment. Mm -hmm. Taking time here. Great. Okay. There you go. Now I'm gonna connect my, my, my uh, kubeconfig. I'm gonna skip straight to the final version, which is Dell. I'm gonna create my EPPF configuration. Uh, sorry, my, uh, my CNI plugin configuration. I'm gonna deploy certain data, like certain application. Untainted, untainted the node for master so I can schedule things on it. And then I'm gonna move my, uh, I'm gonna move my CNI configuration here. There you go, container creating. Whew, I don't know what the last time I didn't work. All right. I don't know, like sometimes you do that thousand times before it works you have to do it in front of people breaks right <laughs> I guess that's the deal all right um, okay so all the pods are running amazing so I can go to basically take a look at the configuration um, so yeah if I, I do an exact if I do a curl I'm getting result from HTTP bin so basically this sleep pod this sleep pod think about it as the client and HTTP bin has been the server. So it's just to simulate client-server connectivity. Awesome, there you go, good. Let's keep going. So let's go back to the slides quickly just to explain what we're going to do in the next step. Here's what we're going to do. So we created our bridge plugin, awesome. Now what we want to do Every time we're gonna create the V8 pair, and every time we're gonna create the interface in our container, we want to plug in an, X, like, uh, an eBPF code. That's it, that's the goal for this first exercise. Let's write our first eBPF 
code. Very simple. So in our case, again, we're going to attach every single time EPPF at every single interface we create. Let's go back to our environment. Let's get started here. So let's take a look at a very basic BPF code. You can open the editor here and let's go through it. In this example, in, my, in all this workshop, I'm using XDP. We could have been using TC because more Cilium related, but I mean XDP too. But XDP, the, the good thing here is that is very simple. You can actually go uh, online. There's a lot of XDP uh, information. You know, there's a lot of tutorials. I can give you links at the end of this workshop to go and learn more about it. So I think XDP is the right technology to first play with, with eBPF in the networking space. So here's the code that we are going to create. You know, ignore the includes that actually we're using this library called libbpf that allows us to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, write our BPF code. But the main thing that we need to be, you know, watching for is, so this, uh, the section, in our case, we are putting XDP. The section is defining which kind of hook we are looking for, okay? So in this case, the section is saying, well, we are going to trigger this on XDP, on the XDP hook in our network stack. Then every time we, we get there, we're gonna process this method here called process XDP. You can call it whatever, it doesn't matter. The name here doesn't really matter. I think the section matters more. And then every time, again, I talked about the fact that every layer has different, like more information. And since it's very low level, in, in XDP, we have, a, the, we have access to this structure called XDPMD. So what we are going to do is straightforward. The first step is we're gonna get the data. So every time the packets go through this V8, virtual, like every time we, we capture this packet, we are going to do a couple things. So we captured the data, which is the packet. We're gonna capture the beginning and the end, right? Then we're gonna to try to parse this data as if it's like an ethernet, you know, packet. We're gonna make sure that basically the data itself is not bigger than the ethernet packet. Basically, if that happens, that means that's a, that's a bad packet. That's actually something you don't need on your system. That's the first filtering, basically. You are filtering bad traffic going through your services. That's what we're doing here. XDP report, uh, abort, the way in XDP, the way it works, there is codes for everything. If you return a certain value, it instructs the XDP code or eBPF code to do something. In our case here, XDP abort just, you know, stops. Like it doesn't process this, it doesn't process this, this code. It's not gonna filter out, it's just gonna not run on this, on this particular code. Then the second, the second thing is, we're gonna check actually if this is like an ethernet, you know, IPv, IPv4 code. Like are we looking for an IPv4 structure? And for that we're using, uh, you know, we're just checking the proto on our, on our code and saying, well, does it match? There's a predefined proto for, uh, you know, value for, for a, a, an IPv4 uh, packets. We're gonna check that, okay, that's good. If that's a packet that is IBV4, then it's not IBV4, then just pass. XDB pass says, it means just like, follow, don't do anything, right? We don't need to do anything right now. Just forward this packet, it's not, I don't have to deal with it. Now, if it's, an, if it's actually an IPV4 packet, then we can get more data. And we, we, here we're forwarding to, we are, we are actually going to parse it into an IPv4 structure, right? As part of this IPv4 structure, first we're gonna check, hey, is it actually an IPv4 structure here, right? If it's not, so if it's the size of it is too big, then well, again, two, I don't have to run XDP in this case, abort. But now again, 
if it's actually a valid packet, an IPv4 packet that we parse it correctly, okay, so now I have access to the source and, and destination address, all the things that, get, that, that comes with the IPv4 uh, structure. So what I can do, look, I can print in the kernel, right, that's the thing. Here we're printing in the kernel the source and the destination address. We're gonna say, hey, I got a packet from this address and I get the, this packet is going to this address. And let's print that again on the kernel side. And that's it. Let's actually run this code. Let's go back to the terminal. Let's actually just uh, pull the dependency, which is libbpf in our case. And then let's actually build this binary. We're building this binary using clang. Just actually, our, our C builder in this case, it's, it built it into a BPF code. Okay, at this point, we have our first BPF code compiled. We're good. Let's actually now use it on our interface. What, to do this, we, we actually need to load, we have to load a specific BPF program. The binary that got outputted for the previous command is now loaded under sys FS, BPF, e BPF, CNI. Okay, so again, at this point, I have some EPPF code that can be used. I haven't done the wiring in my CNI to every time I create an inter interface, attach this code to it, not yet. We're gonna do this in this section. So learn, let's run this command. Let's get to the editor to take a look at what we did. No, sorry, on the editor tab, which is a CNI plugin. Do some refresh. It's the exact same code as earlier. The only difference, the only difference is here, is after I actually output my result, I'm saying, okay, everything is good. Well, actually, wait a second. Before we finish this, let's actually attach this BPF code that I just loaded. And we are using BPF tool net attach XDP on the Inter, like on the interface, interface, sorry, we just created, okay? This command here is basically saying, run this XDP code every, on every packet that goes through this interface. The network interface we created for the networking in our pod. Again, it, it seems maybe complicated, but it's very straightforward. We wrote some code, we built it, we loaded it, and then we attached it to a specific interface. In this case, I'm using BPF tool for this. But again, if you wanna do this in a real scenario, and for example, Cilium, the way they do it in other projects, there's different loaders. There's actually some code, like you can write it in Go, for example, that grabs, you know, they're gonna grab this, this BPF code and attach it to a certain interface, you know, in Go, instead of like using a CLI like I'm doing. CLI here is just for simplifying things. Awesome, so now I modified my CNI code, that's great. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, yes, I'm going to basically update, you know, I'm moving this CNI code to OPT CNI bin again when we have the CNI previously, so I'm overriding the old code. And let's just delete the pod. We're going to delete the pod just to force the uh, recreation of the, the, the new network interfaces, uh, the new pods with the CNI code, uh, CNI plugin code attached to it. So, okay, my two pods are now up and running, which is awesome. So if I run, let's say I'm gonna run some, some traffic. There you go, so I'm making a curl. What do you guys think would happen now? Now that I run the code, the packets went through the V8, my XDP code it got executed, and I should have logs now in the kernel that shows that this packet got processed. Let's take a look. We are reading the kernel logs. There you go. We see curl, got packet from something to something. Okay, there you go. Our first eBPF code, it just printed something, it, it just got automatically using our CNI, we not only created all the networking things, 
all the networking components for the, the plugin for uh, sorry for the the pod to be wired correctly so we can interact with it but we also loaded an xdp code for us to do stuff on it right we haven't done yet nothing we just log, logged some some uh, the, the 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 source and the destination address but now let's do some interesting things all right so the next section the next exercise is to use eppf for different scenarios eppf again can be used for multiple things the main three things that we can think about in networking is eppf can be used for monitoring so you can have like metrics and and, and stats around your traffic it can be used for security so to block you know calls that you don't want or traffic from a to b you know without you know interrupting basically packets that are not meant to be sent to from a to b for example and the third aspect or or rate limiting actually or a lot of controls basically can do in security and the third aspect is routing routing for example in in Cilium, i showed you you know the data earlier Cilium use it as a replacement of kube proxy you don't need actually to use ipvs or i uh, you know ip tables for routing ip tables being they got created for firewalling, not actually for traffic routing. You can use EPP, uh, EBPF and XDP in this case to get way faster uh, traffic routing. In our example, in today's uh, workshop, we're going to probably focus on the two things. Monitoring, and we're going to focus on um, security, like a small example. So before we start talking about, before we start talking about monitoring in details, Actually, something we haven't talked about yet is the, the um, you know, I talked about EPPF running in the sandbox in the kernel code, but you cannot get data out of that. You know, kernel is basically in isolation in our system. There's no way to interact directly to get metrics or whatever. In our user space, user space is basically everything you run on, 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 on your node, everything you create, that's user space. Now, a user space program cannot interact directly with a kernel space program. They, the way they interact, they, the way they interact and interchange data is to use what we call a BPF map. A BPF map, like it says here, it's just a map, it's a certain type of map. You can do like a ring buffer, for streaming data, you can do hash maps for key value storage. You can do arrays for just like saving a random number of things. Basically, you define a map, and then now the kernel space, the eBPF program that we wrote, can write to that, can write to that map, and actually the user space program can also write to that map, read write in both directions. Like the user space program can read and write to the map, and same thing for the kernel space program. So what we are going to do in the next exercise we created already our bpf code we just demoed a log to the kernel now let's do something a bit more interesting what we are going to do is a couple steps we are going to capture the traffic i mean we did that er earlier same thing we are going to basically write write uh, the number of packets that we receive from a certain source in the map we're going to create basically a map first before all that. But then we're going to create the, the number of packets we receive from a certain source in a map. And then we're going to use what we call a user space program to go and read a certain map and expose that as metrics that we can see in Prometheus. Okay? That's basically full cycle around monitoring. And all that needs to be loaded using our CNI. So let's go. Let's do it. Um, so the first step here, so you click on next. All right, man, who's tired here? <laughs> uh, I mean, 5.30 in the afternoon, I get you. All right, so let's create the map. The map is pretty straightforward. What we have to do is define a structure in a certain way, define the values we need to store in, and label it a certain way, and that basically what creates a map. So in our case here, we go back to the editor, 
take a look at the code. There you go. This is the new code of basically the monitoring. So what we do first is defining the structure that is basically defining the key value. And we give it a name. We call that counter. That's our map name. It's called counter, OK? We define that is basically storing a key size of u32 and a value size of u64. That's it. Think about it as a hash map, has a key value pair where the key is a certain size, the value is a certain size. Very simple. Now, same thing as all our code from earlier, so we don't really care about this. The only thing actually we care about is after now at this point, since we actually have the source address of a packet, let's put that in the value and call that source IP key. So the key is the source of a certain packet. So the IP address of a certain packet. And every time we basically, we're gonna do, we're gonna run this, this uh, method here that comes with libbpf. Again, I'm using like this library called libbpf. They're going to give us access to the map. So you can just call uh, the BPF map and look for the key. If this key, which is the source address, exists, just increment it. Just say, OK, well, I got one more packet, another packet. Every time I see the key, increment the, key, increment the value. If it doesn't actually exist, well, I'll just say, hey, I received my first packet. Right? Again, if else, very basic here. And then we do return XDP pass, which, mean, which means forward this packet. Let, let it go. Let, let, let it continue on the networking here. So we're going to do the same exact step we did earlier. So we're going to build our, we're going to build our, um, yeah. So we, we built our uh, BPF code, and then we loaded it again. So we kind of did a reload here. And we don't have to modify our CNI because it's actually pointing the same value, slash sys, fs, bpf, ebpf, CNI. All right, so let's delete the pods just for us to force them to restart with this new code we just created. Take about a second here to, to, uh, to create the new pods for us. And we're gonna see what happens. All right, so the two pods being recreated now let's send let's send a packet. Let's send some traffic. So we're doing a, gonna do a curl call from the sleep pod to the uh, HTTP bin pod. There you go. I got res I'm getting some results. I can run this a couple of times. It doesn't really matter. Oops, I actually deleted my my pods. But yeah, I have to. Uh, oops, where's my curl? Yeah. So let's do this. Right, I'm getting some returned. Now, if I use this BPF tool map that's gonna dump the values under the counter, again, I created the map, I called it counter, okay? So it's automatically now loaded. If I run this, this command, there you go. I see now two elements, two values in my BPF, in my, in my BPF map. So every time I'm running some traffic within my V8 pair, now a certain value is getting incremented in my counter. You saw the power here? Basically, we did pretty much nothing to get certain metrics out of eBPF. Actually, now let's use what we call a user space program. Right? User space program, again, is, is a way for us to interact with eBPF. We are going to use this cool project I found online called eBPF Exporter. Right? It's, um, it's, it's, it's on, on GitHub. It allows us to automatically go and read an eBPF map. We don't have to write any code. So this is running. So if I do this curl localhost, there you go. See that? Now, automatically, now I have Prometheus metrics that is representing the BPF code, the, the BPF metrics as, as Prometheus metrics. And actually, I can even use, uh, you know, Prometheus here to capture that. There you go. And if I restart Prometheus, now if I go to Prometheus, right? Let's take a look at what we have. 
Now we can do let's see counter. Let's see what we have here. Uh, I think it's called Do you, you see it? Oh. Did you put the metric name here? Oh. Oh, okay. I do things right sometimes. I just don't realize. It just that uh, okay great so you see here we have the two metrics coming back and awesome so here if you do like under I don't know like five minutes and take a look look you see that we built a CNI plugin and we built some EPF code that go and count packets automatically load that and now we can see that on on in Prometheus we did that in you know let's say a session so basically. Ba on EPPF, with EPPF, we can do things very low level, super fast. You can think about that. Think about things you can do here. Okay, here it was a very basic example, but now you can write the C code to do probably anything you want with the packets. And talking about anything we want, let's talk about the next example. So we talked about monitoring. Let's see what we can do next. And what we can do next is uh, basically security. Right? So, who here use network policies? Pretty much a lot of people. All right. Network policies is a fundamental component of, you know, networking in communities. It allows us to deny traffic from A to B and do a lot of fine tuning, defining multi tenancy and all of the things. Network policies, in if you want to use EPPF for that, you probably would use something similar to what I'm showing you right now. If you want to implement that, let's say from scratch. And again, this is a very, very basic scenario. So what we are going to do for the next example is pretty straightforward. We are going to first create, we're going to create our uh, network policy in Kubernetes, okay? Just as a, a super basic one, simple, uh, just for, for demo. We're going to create a user space program to kind of read this network policy and actually go and create certain rules in like our BPF map. Then our eBPF uh, code on the kernel side gonna read these rules from the map and enforce something. That actually, if you think about Kubernetes and network policies enforcement using eBPF, in a nutshell, that's how it works. I know this is very much simplifying it a lot, but yeah, you have a process that's gonna watch for Kubernetes uh, policies, it's going to transform it into data that can be pushed into a BPF map. On the other side, you have an EPPF code that reads from this map and enforce the, the policy. So let's do it. Let's see how this would work in Kubernetes, or actually in our example here. So, all right, so let's keep going here. Let's get to our example. Click on next. All right, let's start. So for this example, we're defining a new map. We're calling that IP rules. It's very straightforward. We're actually putting the kind of, you know, a key pair. That's the, the bit more complicated thing. As a key, it's not like a straightforward, like we're not using a, a direct like an int value or something. We're using it in a pair source destination. So if we see this source and destination, that's gonna be the key. The value is going to be a Boolean, like just zero or one. And every time we see this key source destination with value zero or one, it will be for us, if it's one, allow the traffic, zero, stop the traffic. Very simple. So yeah, let's keep going here and let's create our map. Let's take a look at the eBPF code that we just updated. And let's skip through kind of the first whatever we talked about when we 
you know, we talked about um, monitoring. Let's focus on security. So we have this section again. It's a key pair source address going to be the key. The value is Boolean. It just it's going to be a zero or one. Now, in modification of our code, scroll all the way down. The same logic we used to write in the map, we're going to just read from the map. Actually, we're going to do both. What we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, define a key pair with the source address is the source address of the packets. The destination address is the destination address of a certain packet. So this is our key pair. This is our key right now. And take a look at the map. If you don't see any value, meaning we didn't define any rule, put, put, put one. Say, hey, while well, that traffic is allowed, put that in the map. It's fine. So for us, we can see that from A to B, a certain packet has been allowed. Now, if you see explicitly in our map that the value we defined for this kind of interaction is zero, then just drop that packet. We don't want it. All right, let's block that. Amazing. That's it. That's pretty much what we need to do to define a way to enforce rules between two, like a source and destination address using eBPF. So let's uh, get back to here. So we, yeah, so we, we updated the code. Let's build it again, the same, same thing we did earlier. Let's build it again and reload the new code. Let's delete the pods. I'll wait for them to be ready so we can keep going. Take a couple seconds here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in this, this is a very simple example, but yes, you can define, like, you can use the map as, hey, well, it's our source of truth of, like, what should happen in my networking, right? In my example, I'm populating, like, one saying, hey, allow traffic for all the pods, all the, every time I see, like, a pair source address, if I, if I don't have an explicit rule, put something in the map saying, hey, well, I have one, meaning, like, I allowed it. But if I explicitly see a zero, then... Well, that, that is actually my, my, but then you can structure, this is an example, you can structure basically your BPF map like you want. It just needs to map your logic that you would have to do in your backend. So using lots of stacking and unstacking, the packet, does it, does it have any performance impact? Uh, on XDP, very, very minimal, uh, because we're not, we're not unpacking. It's not like, we are just, you know, the, we're just, you know, watching for the structure. It's not, we're not, we're not modifying the packet itself, right? Like it's, it's, it's mostly, like you can, I mean, you can modify the packet itself, but when you just take a look at it, in our case, in this, all examples, we didn't do, we didn't rewrite the packets. We just looked at the packet and made the decision to either monitor that, and in this case, we're going to just enforce certain policy. Yes, we are talking about very, very XDP. It's pretty much, you know, the packet, you don't, you can't see much from it. Up, more you go up, more you can see stuff. So, yeah, let's uh, run a command here. Let's, let's make a call and uh, take, a, take a look. Take a look at this uh, map. Now we have a new map that we call IP rules that has source and destination address with certain value. Basically, we allow traffic from, if you see that split, like, you know, it's kind of the same value, like flipped, but basically a request response. We send a re request to a, from sleep pod to HTTP bin, it's a one, and from HTTP bin to sleep, when it goes back for the response, it's one, two. So, yes, let's um, actually look at, now let's look at a user space program that can write these rules. For that, I, I wrote something quick for, for you guys to, to read. I, we can open the, on the editor, on the user space code. I already wrote this quickly just for us to, to, to save time. Uh, it's what, what it does is very straightforward. It's going to look for the binary of the BBF code that we just wrote, and it's going to load it, so we're going to skip all this. But the interesting is it's going to get values from the 
kind of when we call, we invoke that that's program with three values. We gonna invoke it with the source address, a source IP, a destination IP, and one or zero to say, hey, allow traffic or not. So that's it. That's all we are doing here. So, and if we take a look, actually, I already built this for a matter of time. Take a look at the a binary. I already have it. So again, if we take the, if we test the traffic already, that would work. But now let's actually put a, an explicit rule to would stop the traffic. For that, I'm using the binary. Take a look. You see, IP rule. This is the binary of the user space I created. I'm putting the source address is the, the IP of the sleep pod. The destination is the IP of HTTP bin pod. And the value I'm putting for the rule is zero, meaning, hey, well, block this traffic. Let's do this, run it. Meaning now in our BPF map, we can take a look at the value. Explicitly, I see a zero here, so don't let this packet go through. And now if I make a call again, Voila, blocked, no traffic between A to B, okay? This is much, this is basically the very simple version of like how we can enforce rules. Actually, you know what, as a fun exercise, I just recreated, and you don't do that, okay? That's not how it should be. I actually created um, a bash program that just go and parse Here's the, bas the, the, the bash program. I created a bash program that goes and basically just watch for Kubernetes network policies. You would actually use Golang and the client, the kube client for that. Don't, don't use that. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm looking for any network policy and I'm actually taking a look at if, if the source and destination address are allowed, then put an IP rule to allow the traffic. If not, deny all other traffic. So by default, everything is blocked. But if if um, if this if, if I have a cube network policy that is explicitly allowing traffic from A to B, then allow that. Right? It's very simple. So if I use this code, uh, I'm going to deploy this here. Right? Basically, by default, it's blocking all the traffic. There you go. Now look, let's create this super basic network policy in Kubernetes. We're defining, hey, the matching label, actually, you know, the destination label in this case is HTTP bin, and the source address is sleep. So if, you, if we execute this, call, this, this, uh, this code again, which is actually allow, calling from sleep to, uh, to HTTP bin, it's not working, right? Because by default, I'm blocking all the traffic. But if I go and copy my network policy, create that in Kubernetes, See if that got created. There you go. It got created on Kubernetes now. My code is running the, in, you know, I'm just doing a loop of like 10 seconds. So it's gonna go, there you go. It detected the queue policy. It's allowing traffic now from the, 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 the pod that is ending with 200 and the pod that's ending with 15, which is the sleep pod and the HTTP bin pod. And if I run the code again, there you go. We just created a very tiny, tiny, tiny cilium, right? That's basically take a Kubernetes policy, um, create, you know, write, write a value in a map, get an eBPF code that's been attached with a CNI to, a first, to enforce a certain security rule. And with that being said, this is the end of this workshop. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, there's much things to talk about, but. All right, thank you. Again, this is, don't, don't recreate that. I want you after this session to be able to open the hood of a car and saying this is the battery and this is the engine. And you've opened like, you know, your Kubernetes cluster and look at things like, hey, well, this is probably a map and this is how things are enforced, okay? Yeah. Okay, great, great question. The question is, is C the only language we can use for, to write this program? Unfortunately, on the kernel side, it's C. You're going to have to write your code in C. 
on the kernel side. For the user space, then you have more flexibility. There is, uh, again, uh, if I take, uh, what I, sh I was going to show you actually this, uh, this cool project. If you take a look at the Cilium, you know, the Cilium uh, EPPF repository, it has good example about like how to actually load a certain, you know, load a certain example, like, you know, K-probe, for example. K-probe will have the, the backend code, and you're going to have some, uh, you know, let's say user space code. LibBPF2, Rust can be an option. There are certain technologies that now is kind of doing working on uh, what we call binding, right, on the user space. But the back end, it's still, it's still going to be C, like a, I mean, kernel. Yeah. Yes, a Rust in on the user space. I mean, I'm pretty sure. That's not something like I, I, I'm 100% I'm sure that, you know, let's take a look at libpf actually. Look, if you go to uh, BPF, libpf bootstrap, it has good examples. If you go example here, you can take a look. There's a Rust repo that to give you a couple, a couple things. Let's take a look at XDP. So yeah, actually BPF, no, I think the BPF itself was written in C, right? But I think the loading was in Rust. I think that's where it is. Um, in the kernel space, do you have to worry about normal like concurrency constructs and stuff like that? Because when you're doing the incrementing, there's yeah, yeah. Like I that. mean, you, you you should you should probably there is. I mean, again, I didn't like very much double like you know talk too much on on the BF map. There's BPF map that are very much isolated by per, by CPU uh, and and so on. So you can define you know when you're writing any resource, obviously concurrency is a, is a it, it may be a problem, but um, but most of the time you just need to design the right the right thing. So if, if, you're writing, if you're writing a map, just try to figure out the right use case for, for, for you. If like something that is very much segregated for a node, for example, to like limit like the interaction between multiple users, it can be an option. But yeah, I think that's something that you still have to worry about. But is, uh, but you know, if you look at, look, if you look at libbpf and look at any lot of projects, there's a lot of like, it's emerging. There's a lot of new, new code, new technology that kind of simplified life for you. Like when you write a specific code, um, I didn't talk about much, but eBPF is very strict, very strict. You cannot just go and create any C code. Once it's, it detects that you are going to you know, write something out of range or do something that is, should not be doing, it's not going to allow you to even build it. Or if it builds it, it, it doesn't allow you to, to mount it. So. I think you have a lot of controls there. And if you look at the BPF code, uh, look at BPF tools, it helps you like, like answer these questions you have. Any other question? Sorry, could. Yeah. To know that actually this BPF code got been invoked? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so you saw what we did with, uh, with IP rules. We set like zero, and like if the rule got been blocked, blocked is like a one or something. That's how you should design probably your BPF code. You should actually think about, OK, I'm going to define the rule. The rule for me is to block A to B. But also, I need to define the monitoring aspect. And let's, let's create, let's define the, res let's say, you can create a metric, like we did earlier, to say, Every time I'm blocking from A to B because of my code, go create this metric that you can go and put that in Prometheus and alert on it, right? Just, again, when you create your eBPF code, think about the monitoring aspect and also the enforcement aspect. Oh, so you're saying, is, can, we, can we take a look if a certain, there's, okay, so, if you, if you use like, uh, in, in my example, I'm using BPF tool, right? BPF tool is pretty cool, and you can use different things. You can use BPF cool, uh, BPF, BPF cool, I think it's a good name. BPF tool on a certain interface, it's going to list all the eBPF code that's been attached to an interface. So you can always go back and say, oh, wait, like, wait, this kind of actually thing is not working. 
oh, let, let's run BPF tool on a certain interface. Okay, well, all these things are being attached. Therefore, this is why it's enforced. What's Network interface, correct. Network interface. Yeah, yeah. eBPF is, is definitely, again, we are just seeing that in the, in the context of networking. But eBPF code can be running for, let's say, sys calls or like system calls or opening a file here, you know, things that are in, you know, let's say you want to monitor other aspects of Linux. It doesn't have to be networking. But it, obviously, interface comes in discussion when we're talking about networking for sure. Okay, thank you very much for joining this session. Hope to see you soon and have a good KubeCon. <laughs>